somehow personify a professional ideal. And for me, Stan has always been one of those. Um, I remember watching him on CNN as a real standout of their reporters. Uh, he had the eloquence, the nuance, the authority, and the courage to put together, I think, really the qualities that make a great foreign correspondent. Um, he also happened to have an accent that uh, also made him, made him stand out a little. Um, Stan isn't just a recorder of events, he's someone who in the old journalism cliche has helped write the first draft of history with his reporting. He's the kind of bloke who sought, who went to places uh, to place the events in their proper historical context. And, and I think he's also something of a philosopher, someone who's always turned to philosophy texts to try and make sense of what was witnessing. Uh, you won't be surprised to learn that he's taken all of those skills and poured them eloquently into this book with the falling of the dusk. Stan, it's a real honor to be talking to you this evening. Uh, and Peter, the, the honour is mine, and, and you know that everything you said is returned to you tenfold, mate. Um, absolutely. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. Well, look, thank you very much. But look, you, you are the man of the moment. And let's kick this off. You know, with the falling of the dust, the title, um, it makes it pretty clear from the outset that you think we're headed to a pretty dark place. Yeah, I think we're in a dark place. And it's drawn from uh, a quote by the philosopher Hegel, who said that the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk. It's this idea that we gain wisdom with the nightfall, where we've seen where we have come. And of course, the night gives way to the next day. And for Hegel, it meant that history was, was a process of the striving for freedom, that, that where the master and the slave could find themselves in each other, a search for the ethical state, if you like, the end of history that the great ideological struggles will be put behind us. Now, of course, in 1989, Francis Fukuyama, the American political scientist, coined that phrase of Hegel's, um, the end of history, adopted that to try to talk about the, the success and the victory of, of liberal democracy over communism as being the end of the great ideological struggles. And I pick up from that point and I, I chart that course, which is the, the years that you and I recorded the world, um, to bring us to this moment where I do think this is a moment of deep inflection, liberal democracy in crisis and in retreat, um, the rise of demagogues and autocrats, both within liberal democracies and outside, and the big, big question of our times, the rise of a superpower that is an authoritarian regime that, in their eyes, are beating us at, their, at our own game. And that's a real hinge point of history, I yeah, look, one of the things that, I mean, we'll, you raised a whole, whole, whole host of issues in there. And one of the things that we've come to, you touched on is, is the idea of, of the dusk, the falling of the dusk, which leads to a dawn. In other words, a kind of cyclical idea of time mm. as opposed to a kind of linear narrative of time that, that the West seems to understand history as. We will deal with that in a moment, but, but let's go to the, the kind of first chapter and the idea of, of Western liberalism um, in which you argue that around the world democracy has been backsliding, that we're seeing a resurgence of populism, of nationalism, sectarianism and tribalism, mm. and that all of it feeds on, on history. You seem to think that that's, that's really on the resurgence, that, we, we have, that Western liberalism is, is on the decline. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the assumptions of Western liberalism, Peter, the assumptions of liberal universalism that have really underpinned the birth of the modern world, you know, the modern world, modernity as we know it, is something that is three or four hundred years old, depending on where you first date it from. But essentially, it's a project of the Enlightenment, the search for individual freedom, underpinned by a Judeo-Christian ethic. But that search for freedom, that ability to free ourselves from the bonds of the past, be it, be it monarchy or family or tradition or country, the, the quest for that individual freedom that leads to free markets, um, that has led to globalization and cosmopolitanism. I think all of those things are being challenged. And fundamentally, I think they're being challenged because to my reading, at least, that universal idea, that cosmopolitan ideal is somehow antithetical to what is a very human impulse to belong. And I think the tension between globalism, universalism, a, a, a liberal neutrality, liberal democracy that frees ourselves from those traditions and allows us to renew and redeem ourselves from our past and our history, clashes with that deep instinct and impulse to belong somewhere. And I think that fault line is what I try to trace throughout the world. And I think 
coronavirus has revealed, I think it accelerated some of those trends. I, yes, Dan, I, I, I kind of, I agree with a, a lot of what you're saying, and I've seen the same kinds of trends that you've been talking about, but you know, you and I had this conversation before when we were discussing this, and I, I, I told you then, and I'll, I'll remind you now, that I, mm. I think I'm not as pessimistic as you are, that I, I take um, uh, Steve Pinker, who wrote a book called Our Better Angels, in which he argued mm. that, that over time, over the longer sweep of history, things have generally gotten better, that yes, we still have declines and falls, but the, the grand march of, of history suggests that we are now safer, that we are living longer, that we are healthier, that we're more prosperous than at any time in, in any other time in human history. And even in the first chapter, you, you point out that Freedom House um, charted an increase, a surge in democracy between 1970 and 2010. Mm. You know, aren't we seeing a, a kind of, a blip in, in, in that in that longer that longer arc? I think it's more than a blip. And I think we are seduced by ideas of progress and the long piece. You know, people talk about the Belle Epoque, the beautiful era of the last long piece that of course was shattered by the First World War in 1914. And then people didn't believe that was possible. England and Germany were each other's biggest trading partners. The Kaiser and the King were cousins, and of course we slept walked you know, we, we, in, into, that, into that devastating conflict. Again, we sort of believed that we had come out of that and the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations was going to deliver us to just the sort of Pinker-esque ideal of a cosmopolitan perpetual peace that Immanuel Kant imagined. And of course, that was shattered by the rise of, of fascism and then the slide into war in World War II. Um, you know, I, I know we like to believe that things are on this trajectory that, as Martin Luther King Jr. said and Barack Obama was fond of repeating, that the moral arc of the moral universe is long, that it bends towards justice. But where was justice in Auschwitz? Where was justice in the gulag of the Soviet empire? Where was justice in the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I, I, I think we can be seduced by those long periods of peace, those periods where we in, enjoy economic growth, and stability that are rapidly disrupted and often in the most catastrophic way. And I'll just finish by pointing out, you know, you quoted Freedom House there, which did chart that, that, that surge of democracy in the middle of the 20th century up until 89 and post 89. But in the last 15 years, it has progressively charted the decline of democracy and freedom. 15 years of straight erosion and retreat of democracy. And I suspect that cycle may be more, um, more uh, 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 a reflection of our true nature and our true histories than the Pinkeresque ideal of that moral arc of justice. Except I'm gonna, I'm just wanna dwell on this one, one thing. I'm gonna hold, uh, pull you up on a little bit because I think what Pinker points out, <clears throat> and you, you're right to talk about um, the genocide, the, the second world war, you're right to talk about the bombing of Hiroshima, but one of the arguments that Pinker makes is that our tolerance for these kinds of, of brutalities um, are vastly lower now than they, than they were a few years ago. The kind of carpet bombing that we saw in, De in Dresden um, would be politically um, impossible now, he, he argues. We, we get upset now when we end up with an Australian Special Forces soldier allegedly shooting an innocent man in a field. Now that's shocking and we're right to be mm. shocked by that. The level of, of outrage that that has provoked is vastly different from what we saw in, 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 in even in Vietnam. Um, our tolerance has shifted, and so over over time, yes, we're seeing these kinds of abuses take place, but but we are far less tolerant for, for of, of these kinds of atrocities than than we once were. I, I I would question that level of tolerance, and if there is tolerance, it doesn't stop it happening again, and it doesn't stop us excusing it. Um, of course, we saw with the war in Iraq on the basis of what we now know is a lie um, and what amounts to essentially a war crime, um, the, the invasion of another country on, on the pretext of a lie of having weapons of mass destruction, um, which upended the entire region, as you know, more than me, um, completely upended that region. And we are dealing with the consequences of that, the blowback of that now with refugees pouring across 
across the world, the devastation of Syria, um, and, and on and on we go, the rise of ISIS. Um, I, 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 I hear you and you say, you know, people won't tolerate those things. And yet I think in the 70s, uh, in the 60s and 70s, we tolerated the carpet bombing of Cambodia, again, by the US, and again, a tantamount to a war crime that the US never, and those perpetuated it, were never held to account for. And despite those lessons of history, we, pl we, we plunge back into that type of catastrophe and we excuse it and the media is often complicit in that. And when I wonder, I wonder about the level of tolerance for suffering. I think we may have a less of a tolerance for our own, but we tolerate enormous suffering in other parts of the world. The world right now is on the verge of what the World Food Program is called a biblical famine. Um, if we look at COVID and the, the rush to a vaccine, Yes, we have we've done that, but 16% of the world's population in the Western countries are hoarding more than 60% of the vaccine. And of course, in Australia, just today, 30 years since the Black Deaths in Custody Royal Commission, this, this beacon of tolerance and multiculturalism and prosperity and cohesion and democracy allows Aboriginal people to be locked up in obscene numbers, die still in custody, so I would, I would question again our level for tolerance. I think our tolerance is selective. I think the pinker ideal of that tolerance and what we will abide is very selective. And if it is the best of times, as Pinker and others would suggest, it is the best of times for those who have the best of it. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's hard to, that is hard to argue with, that, that the, what the world is, is, has been crafted for a particular group of people. And I suppose those people are, are people like me, white, male middle class you know english speaking to a large extent the antithesis of that not the antithesis of that but a challenge to that idea is is china and you've spent a lot mm. of time as a china correspondent you've observed that closely and, and the, the kind of china's development I, I'm, I avoid i'm deliberately avoiding the word progress here but china's development or china's the china's growth um you portray very much as a challenge to Western ideas of mm. modernity, of that nexus between freedom and prosperity, the kind of idea that we, we sold to the Chinese, in fact, in a lot of ways. Can you just explain that contradiction? I mean, the reality is, and again, to come back to that idea, again, of Pinker's ideal or, or the Fukuyama ideal or the Hegelian ideal of an arc of the moral universe and justice and an end of history and a that finds itself in a global um, universal liberalism. For the first time in three to 400 years within this decade, the dominant economic power of the world, ergo perhaps the most powerful country in the world, will not be a Western liberal country. It won't come out of that tradition, even more so. It is born out of a resentment at that tradition. And while the Chinese Communist Party has embraced aspects of market reform, it has steadfastly rejected the political liberalism that may accompany that. Now, the liberal assumption was always that as people become more rich, they become more free, that there was an impulse for human freedom. And indeed, it was that impulse for human freedom that, that generates the innovation and the creativity that drives that sort of growth. China is, is standing that idea on its head too. Um, what I saw in China was undoubtedly an authoritarian regime that become even more so. There is a brutality to that. And yet I also saw in people that I knew and the lives I observed up close and friends of mine, that you can be happy in an authoritarian regime and you can be desperately unhappy in a liberal democratic regime, that the inequalities in liberal democracy, the alienation and the disenchantment and the disenfranchisement from the political process mock the idea of liberal democracy and that authoritarianism particularly in the early stages of growth, and this may be tested as China becomes a more middle-income country, but in that early stages, answers a lot of those questions. And people are happy to surrender their, free, their freedom for their security. And you don't need liberal democracy for happiness or human flourishing. And that's a shocking idea for the West. And it shocks me too. I'm Stan again. I, I I take your point, and I hear what you're saying, and I've also seen the way in which a lot of people are very happy under those sorts of circumstances. In fact, I, my my father's family 
um, are Latvians and the Latvian, a lot of my older mm -hmm. relatives still pine nostalgically for the days of the Soviet Union, the, the sort of assurance, the, 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 the predictability, the stability that they saw there. But what your, your ideas are, are, are great, but try and see how someone who's living in Tibet or the Uyghurs mm -hmm. would feel about what you're saying. At least with Western liberalism, we have a set of standards, we have a, a set of moral and ethical principles that go with that, that we can hold the government to account and say, look, you're failing when it comes to the treatment of Aboriginal people. But we can't do that when it comes to the Chinese and their treatment of Uyghurs, because, because that's a part of what authoritarianism is. Yeah, China, of course, would argue that there are a different set of ethical principles. Um, and the Chinese Communist Party, and by, by repeating this, I'm not endorsing it, but I'm just stating a fact that they would say that the economic advancement and the improvement in the lives of people materially um, is a form of liberty and freedom in and of itself. I would also sort of push back a little bit against, I mean, what you described there is a, is a liberal ideal of justice and freedom that I don't think necessarily existed during the post-89 neoliberal era when the, the type of bonds and social contracts of society that you're identifying there um, and the redemptive nature of liberal democracy was really tested by the predominance of the market. That was Margaret Thatcher, after all, who said there is no such thing as society. There is just an economy. The gross inequalities that we saw grow during that, the, 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 the heights of that neoliberal era, that all came crash, crashing down, at least on the most vulnerable, during the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Um, yes, yes, if you are a Uyghur, if you are a Tibetan, the recourse to justice that we imagine in our societies is simply not there. And yet again, I would say the recourses for justice for Aboriginal people are simply not there in Australia either, given the appalling reality that people live in, in a prosperous liberal democracy. The United States that has never atoned for the sins of its own history. There is no reparations for African Americans for the legacy of slavery and the lived reality of slavery. That the American ideal um, of freedom and equality was born out of genocide of First Nations and the brutal slavery um, of, of Africans. Um, and that those things persist still in liberal democracies today. Liberal democracy has a deep problem with history. It has a deep problem with equality and it reinforces structures of power that give the appearance or maybe even tempt people with the idea of liberation. But for the vast number of people, that liberation does not arrive. And I think we have seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the, the anger and the protest vote that helped put Trump in the White House, uh, with the rise of populism across Europe, the resurgence of white supremacy across Europe, I think we are seeing again the strains of that social contract in liberal democracy by a whole host of people who simply don't believe it. Yeah, in fact, one of the things, and this actually brings me to that idea of, of history, um, um, the Western idea of history clashing with, with others. And it, there's a fantastic quote that I really wanted to, to read, um, which I thought was really beautiful. You write, you're writing about Muhammad, um, an Afghan, um, and you say, we were exiles, Muhammad and me, occupying an uncertain place in the world. We were cast adrift, searching for a somewhere to call home with our true homes, always just out of reach. Muhammad and I were prisoners of freedom, captives of the West's dream of the future. I, I, I think that's a beautiful description, a beautiful articulation of that kind of contradiction that, you, that you've just described. Yeah, th thank you for that. And let me just tell you about Muhammad, the people listening is, Muhammad was a man I met in Baghdad at the height of the war, um, when he did an interview with him and we got talking to each other and he asked me about my story and I told him about being an Aboriginal Australian and, you know, the invasion and the genocide and the, the segregation, the exploitation of my own people had lived through. And, he, and we identified something very deep within both of us. And he went to his room and he came back out with a jar and in that jar was some dirt. And he put it in my hand and he said, this is my home. It was the last thing he gathered as he fled his home in Janine in the 1967 war to go to Baghdad where war had followed him again. And it was that sense of exile, Peter. I feel an exile. I feel an exile 
from my own country. I feel sometimes an exile even from my own people, Aboriginal people, because I am sort of cast adrift. Muhammad was an exile. There are so many people I've met who were these exiles who live with that, that promise of a home, that promise of liberal peace, that promise of liberal freedom that always remains just out of reach. And I think the difference here is that, you know, if you are white, if you are European, there are questions that you never have to ask that a system that created modernity and philosophies that created modernity were created for you and by you. And I remember that great quote of Franz Fanon, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the French African um, philosopher and thinker. He said, oh, my body, it makes me a man who asks questions. If you are black, if you are Muslim, if you are Chinese, if you are from the other side of history, it is your body that makes you ask those questions. Yeah, it's one of those things I've, I've really come to grips with or been forced to come to terms with as well, particularly as a journalist, as a correspondent. It's, it's the ideas that we take as, as givens, as universals, the idea of progress, of time, mm. of liberal Western, of, liberal, of ideas of liberalism and human rights, uh, feel so so given that they are that they are universal they're presented as universal mm. truth in fact um, you know human rights is 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 intended is is written into into the un's constitution into the un documents um and yet when you interrogate that for a lot of indigenous people in a lot of the lands that i've covered and you've covered we've both covered mm. that that doesn't really hold up can you just describe a little bit what time in history looked like to someone who isn't from the West? I think it's a fundamental question I ask in the book, and, and that is this notion of linear time and progress, which is very much tied to a Western conception of the world. It arrives you know, out of Newtonian physics and then the response to Newtonian physics by a whole raft of philosophers who said, well, if Newton has unlocked the immutable laws of the universe, how do we live within those laws on earth? And I suppose that led them to this idea of, of, a, of a propulsion of history, of a search for freedom, of a linear time scale. We don't live in that. Um, Aboriginal people don't live in a linear time scale. Um, William Stannard, the great anthropologist, coined a beautiful phrase, the every when, to describe the dream, that the past, and the present and the future are, exist simultaneously for us. And, and it's a hard thing to intellectualize for people who see life in terms of inevitable progress and linear time. But I can only say that when I'm back on my country, on my land, I feel all of that at once, now and forever. The Maori people talk about the, the future being behind them. The Chinese people have a different conception of time. And there's, you know, I, I think it, it does go to the universal assumptions of progress. And of course, as a result of that, you can see how ideas of, of Western philosophy and Western science have been about conquering, subduing nature, bending time to your will. And when it comes to history, the idea that history is something that you leave behind, we may commemorate it, we may recall it, we may write history books, but we don't live in it. We move beyond it. And in many respects, I'm really seduced by that. I like that as a liberating idea, but I think it is, it is antithetical to that human impulse to belong and connect yourself deeply to your history. If yeah. you add to that, Peter, a wound and historical grievance, and you and I talked about the Balkans as a great example of this, that wound, that grievance, what Nietzsche called that all-consuming historical fever, becomes the source of your identity, sometimes in very toxic ways, but undeniable. Yeah, I remember, you know, when I was in, in Baghdad, sorry, in Sarajevo covering the Yugoslav war, that was the first conflict I'd ever, I'd ever covered as a journalist. And I remember time and again, asking Serbs where, where, where all of this began, how did the conflict start? And invariably, they'd sit back in their chairs and look back at the, look up at the sky and say, well, back at the Battle of Kosovo Podium in 1379. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 1379, it's, it's, it's just kind of incomprehensible to, to, mm. to those of us who, for whom a historical memory is, is you know, less than 200 years. We, we don't seem to conceive of time as going back any further than that. And when you're confronted by that, that idea, 
you see what you've been talking about, that sense of place. And I realized in a lot of the coverage that I did, and I think you've done the same thing too, that you cannot understand what is taking place unless you understand history. And we're not yeah. talking about um, the tens of years, we're talking hundreds and sometimes thousands of years of history. Uh, Peter, I, I think it may be the difference between a Western conception of citizenship um, which is, again, a very post-Enlightenment ideal and a Westphalian ideal of what constitutes a nation state and what it is to be citizens of that state versus what is a very different blood and soil sense of belonging, civilizational rather than national. You'll find it in the Muslim world. You'll find it in Turkey. Um, you'll find it in China. You'll find it in Australia with Aboriginal people. But you'll find it in Ireland as well a deep, deep historical memory in a civilizational sense of belonging. And I, I really think that is, a, that is a real fault line in our world that, that the Western conception of liberalism and progress really struggles to deal with that. I have to say too, it's not always, in fact, it's often not a good. It can lead to a toxic identity based on a grievance that is forever prosecuted. Um, and, and, a, and an attempt to reclaim a golden age that perhaps never even really existed, that the wars that you and I have covered are absolutely wars of identity. Yeah, and I think that's one of the great, that's one of the great problems with, with not problems, but one of the great challenges of your thesis. And, and that's that at one level, one, I, at one, in one respect, you are arguing about the failures of liberalism and yet what liberalism does and we discussed this earlier as well that it it is liberating it mm. untethers you from those historical mm. norms now one of the things that you raise one of the points that you raised and it's really stuck with me since that conversation you pointed out that australia is an enlightenment country that maybe even more completely than even the united states or france can you just explain what you yeah mean? well you know we often overlook this Australia is born of the Enlightenment. It comes into being as this modern Australia, sandwiched between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. And those ideas, they are, they are revolutions of ideas. America and France are the epitome of what it is to live in that post-Enlightenment world, to wrestle with what are the natural rights of humanity versus the rights of the state ideas of liberty, egalitarianism, of fraternity, of freedom. And Australia, but, but France and the United States are also bedeviled by a history that they cannot, as much as they may wish those things away, cannot avoid. And yet in Australia, I think the ahistoricism is far more complete. If, if liberalism and the Enlightenment is about breaking free of the bonds of the ancient regime, if it's about that renewal, if it's about the search for that freedom beyond, then we do this in Australia by casting off our history. I think part of the compact in Australia is that you come here and that Turk does not have to carry the enmity towards um, Greek or Greek to Turk or Macedonian to Greek or Shia to Sunni or Hindu to Muslim. And it's been a virtue because we live in a nation free of the sectarian and, and identity and historical strife that so many other parts of the world encounter. When it comes to Aboriginal people, we don't have a colony to disappear into. The history, as you said before, in Sarajevo, the wars of the, of the 1300s are in them. I am forever at 1770 or 1788. As much as I... And as much as the liberal ideal of moving beyond history appeals to me in an academic and an intellectual sense, in my bones, I feel that history. And Australia struggles with that and has erased that, erased it perhaps more completely than any other nation I've reported on. Stan, are you, are you predicting the death of liberalism or are you arguing for its reformation? Is it possible yeah. to redeem... The, the latter, but but I tell you, it really requires greater leadership and foresight um, and, a, and an ability and an openness to grapple with those issues than we're seeing at the moment. I think it's being tested in so many ways. I think after the 
the Trump years, we need no more of a wake-up call to what tribalism and, and resentment can deliver in what is meant to be the home of democracy. But whether it be the rightful claims of women to live freely and safely with equality in our society that challenges the grip of the patriarch, whether it is the Black Lives Matter movement that says something that we should not have to say, Black Lives Matter. Um, whether it is the, the, the people who, you know, someone living in an Appalachian trailer park who has seen their factories closed down and their kids go off to war in Iraq and Afghanistan and does not even have proper health care. The, the rise of, of the meritocracy, the concentration of power is eroding faith in democracy. We are, we are weakening the soft guardrails of democracy, our media that is increasingly tribalized, the politicization of the judiciary, the loss of faith in institutions. We've already had royal commissions in Australia into our aged care, our churches, um, you know, our financial industries. Uh, liberalism cannot withstand that. I don't think liberalism will collapse because China is better or China is more powerful. It will collapse because it is failing to deal with its own issues, its own shortcomings. And that's the challenge I want to pose here. If China is, is bringing us to a moment where we could see a authoritarian power usurp the power of liberal democratic states, we can go to war with them, we can try to contain them, and that would be catastrophic, and it still may end up happening. But our greatest defence against him, surely, is to strengthen the bonds of our own liberalism and make it truly accountable. Jürgen Habermas, um, in response to, the, to a lot of what the pessimism of post-World War II Germany, particularly those Jewish philosophers like um, Theodor Adorno, who said, how can you write poetry after Auschwitz? Who saw that the Enlightenment had delivered them to the, to the gas chamber and the gulag who would have rejected the pinker ideal of an endless march towards a more liberal, liberated and empathetic future. And Jürgen Habermas says, no, there is still a liberalism to come, that it is holding true to those ideals that may deliver us to a stronger place. And I think that's where we're at. And that's probably what I'm advocating for, even though I know that that very liberalism has not, and still to a large degree does not include the likes of me and my people. That's a very, I don't quite know how to take this because you, you are, you at the one hand are suggesting that this, that structurally liberalism cannot hold at its core. And that, and that you're asked, you're arguing for a reformation, a transformation of liberalism, almost arguing that we don't have enough liberalism. Mm. That, that there is a kind of- It's a paradox, isn't it, Peter? It's, you know, the strength of liberalism the success of liberalism, um, Patrick Deneen, an, uh, an American writer a couple of years ago, wrote about this, and he, he, he posited the idea that it was the very strength and success of liberalism that had revealed its weakness, that the pursuit of the individual and the rights of the individual can lead to an alienation um, and a loss of community and a sense of belonging that then leads to a blowback against those things. Um, yes, it, it, it is a paradox. Uh, and, and, I, and I come to these ideas knowing full well that the people who constructed the ideas of liberalism were people who did not see it for the likes of me. John Locke, whose ideas essentially wrote the American Constitution, believed that it was okay to steal the land of people who did not worship a Christian monarch or toiled or, you know, tilled the soil. Um, Immanuel Kant, who believed in a perpetual freedom of cosmopolitanism where we see each other in each other, and yet believe that black people, as he said, were stupid, that the world was not designed for them. I'm trying to enter into this liberalism knowing that it was not constructed for me. And yet, as Pascal Bruckner, the French philosopher once said, Western civilization is a jailer, yet it's a jailer that slips you the key. And maybe there's a key for me. Maybe there is something there, Peter, but we're failing the test of our own liberalism right at the time where there is a viable and very powerful and compelling and stable authoritarian alternative. I just want to ask you, before we go to questions, um, I want to ask you a question that, in fact, my partner, Christine, 
suppose we were discussing your book, Christine Jackman, another writer mm -hmm. who, who you know. Um, and she was wondering if you could have written this book if you'd stayed overseas, because it, yeah. it, you, you've got a perspective here that, that feels particularly unique. And I'm, I'm, I'm just curious to know whether, whether yeah. something had to be done here. It's a really perceptive question. Um, she's a smart lady, Christine, so it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I've always felt in exile, as I said before. I recall those words of James Joyce in um, Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, where he said, I go in search of the unconstructed conscience of my race. I looked, I was very aware at a very young age, Peter, of the gross injustice I saw around me. I had uncles and grandparents who were actively involved in the Aboriginal political rights movement. They came out of the church and they were very inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. and the, the, the Christian, black Christ church movement in America. And as I've traveled around the world, I've looked at the world through those eyes. I've carried that history with me. But you're right. I think Christine is right. I don't know that I could have written it anywhere else in the world. I don't know if I can write anything anywhere else in the world because the words come from the soil. They come from my sense of belonging here and the dislocation that I feel here. I, I, I like that sense of exile. I like that sense of being cast adrift. It gives me something to speak back to. I always fantasize about the idea of buying a, a place in sort of, you know, southern France and going there and writing and I'd probably end up eating baguettes and ham all day and writing nothing. I, I'm, I am so inspired by my own country and the struggle of it and the love of it and the rejection of it and all of those things. And it does give me a viewpoint through which to see the world in all of its paradox, all of its contradiction and my struggle to find a place in it. Um. Chrissy, how are we going for questions? That's a fantastic place to end. Um, we do have questions. So, um, yep, we can go to questions. Fantastic. I think it is time. Um, I think it's um, definitely piqued the interest of our audience. There's lots of questions, actually. So um, one of them here from someone called Sanders is, is there any leader in the world, present or potential, who you think could fulfill your vision and hopes for the future? That's a very, very good question. And I, and I struggle with that. I, I really do, sadly. And again, it goes back to this, this conflict between a sort of liberal, universal, cosmopolitan ideal, a land and a world beyond our borders and our faiths and our tribes, um, and the reality that we live in our borders and our faiths and our tribes. I think the most successful popular leaders in, our, in recent times are those who have appealed to those worst instincts. Um, part of that instinct fed into the Brexit decision. Um, Viktor Orban in Hungary plays to those instincts. What we see in Poland, you know, barbed wire going back up and on the borders in Europe to keep refugees out. Vladimir Putin in Russia, Xi Jinping in China, who plays on that humiliation, that sense of national disgrace and revenge. Donald Trump, of course, who played on that um, and said, I'm not here to govern for all Americans. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Duterte in the Philippines. I could go on and on. Bolsonaro. These populists who seize power at the ballot box because they know that there is a sense of alienation, something lost, a grievance that they can feed into. Who are the voices that speak against that? Well, I would have thought and hoped that the likes of Barack Obama may have spoken to that. And Obama spoke about hope and he spoke about that moral arc of the universe and then he failed his first test you know he arrives during the global financial crisis and he, he stands between the people and the bankers and people lost their homes and their jobs and they became embittered and increasingly poor and the bankers grew fat and rich and no one went to jail he staffed his you know his, his financial advisors with former employees of the likes of goldman sachs and other wall street banks in the last three years of the obama presidency life expectancy in the United States decreased for the first time in a hundred years as the country became gripped in an opioid epidemic, suicide epidemic, gun violence, um, people who felt disenchanted and left behind. And it leads to the absurdity and the grotesque show that were the Trump years. So I look around and I don't see that type of figure, that type of leader who can truly 
truly stand against the age, who can make liberalism accountable to itself, but it's going to require things that we don't vote for. If every time a politician goes to the ballot box and says, see what I'm going to do, I'm going to whack a massive tax on the rich and we're going to redistribute this wealth. No one needs $100 billion, but people need health care and they need a roof over their heads and they need proper education. And we're not going to leave people behind and they do not get elected. You do not get elected. So I, I think we get the leaders that we ask for, who we vote for. And right now throughout our world, sadly, we are voting for those that can appeal far too often to the worst instincts rather than to, to quote Stephen Pinker and to quote Abraham Lincoln, the better angels of our nature. There's a um, related question here, actually, um, which is how do you account for the vulnerability of the voting populace in Western democracies to the appeal of, of those kinds of leaders? And, um, you know, like for the, the yeah. US, et cetera. It's real. It's real. Donald Trump did not come from nowhere. The people who voted for him, many of whom, if you look at the way that the votes have split and changed over that time, many of whom have voted for Barack Obama once and even twice. Um, where did that hope go? Where did that hope in an American dream go, if it ever existed? Um, it comes from somewhere. I think there is an absolute cleavage right now between the rural and urban populations. If you look at the Brexit vote, you can draw that line. Um, in the cosmopolitan cities, there was a vote to remain. And in the more rural centres or, the, or the, the regional cities and towns, there was a vote to leave. Um, it's, the, it's the struggle between, you know, the Germans who call a Gemmenschaft and a Gesellschaft. You know, it's that herb town and country. It is, it is that sense of a seeking a place to belong in a community after decades of neoliberalism that elevated the market above community had run down communities. And you only need to go to the United States to look at the type of communities I'm talking about, those urban you know, wastelands or rural towns where the doors are hanging off the hinges and the bridges are rickety and the roads are, are potholed and the schools don't work and there are no jobs and there are shutters over the factories. Go to Detroit and you'll see what the American dream looks like. Um, it comes from somewhere and we need to be accountable for that because this is the world that we have created. You know, in the United States right now, if you're a member of the top 1%, you hold wealth 950 times greater than a member of the bottom 50%. That's not democracy. Yeah. There's a, um, a, a question from Simon Cleary here. Um, are there any liberal models that you can look to um, to better the balance um, between individual freedom and the justice demanded by oppressed communities? Or do we need to discover an entirely new way? I think we've seen this in the past. I wouldn't say that it exists um, now, but we've certainly seen this in the past. We saw it in a lot of the post-war years. We saw it in the you know, the, the FDR New Deal, we've seen projects that have of great redistribution um, that led to, go, you know, to what can be seen as incredibly prosperous and cohesive um, periods in history. You know, we talk about, the, we talk about the, the great generation of the United States, those who, who fought in the war of World War II and came out of that and built that economy and built that middle class. And, and that, that was real. It didn't happen without government intervention. Um, the market, the invisible hand, as Adam Smith would have put it, is not going to deliver that justice. And yet we saw those that are that, that social ideal, that, that sense of responsibility obliterated um, during the heights of neoliberalism, where there was no, no, no community or society. There was just an economy. What you could sell was the measure of your worth. Um, that's not a way to run a society. So there are examples from history where we can look at that. I think if you go back to the, 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 the Hawke-Keating years, um, where you saw a compact in that early stage between the unions, um, business, the microeconomic reforms that were undertaken by the Hawke-Keating governments that saw enormous rupture and disruption to our economy. Remember the, you know, the recession we had to have and interest rates that were hitting double digits and unemployment that was in double digits and and yet we came out of that with a society that was more equal, where there was greater social um, uplift, there was greater social mobility, um, and we ensured a great period of stable economic growth. Um, 
So there are, there are lessons where we can marry an idea of, of liberal reform with, um, with greater social equity. But we don't see that so much anymore. And we see this timidity when it comes to political reform in our own societies. And politicians do not get voted in by being reformist. They get voted in by doing as little as possible, which often ends up feeding back into the same structures and hierarchies of power and privilege that help create the problems. There's a question from Virginia. Um, who sparked your interest in philosophy? Oh, look, it was probably always there. I was always a very philosophical child. And I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a, um, a typical education, you know, because I was so poor, my family was so transient. Um, we were an itinerant black family living on the margins of society, moving from town to town. You know, what we ate was what dad was able to, to work for. Um, we lived in the back of cars and in tents and in caravans. And we moved around with my grandparents, my uncles and aunties and cousins and various relatives. And I just didn't have um, uh, that sort of stable education. I changed schools. 13, 14, 15 times before I was even into high school. I, high school was more stable, but I still went to five different high schools. So there was no continuity. There were great gaps in my education, but I was a voracious reader. Um, I could read, mum said, before I even went to school. My mother would just pick up books anywhere she could find. You know, she went to the secondhand store to get clothes for us. She'd go into those cardboard boxes and pick up handfuls of books she could buy for five cents each. And I come home with them and I'm eight or nine years old and I'm reading in any way or Greek mythology or so that that sparked that interest in reading and ideas and it stayed with me. And I think when I really got out into the world and I started to report, journalism didn't answer the questions. Um, history didn't answer the questions. Philosophy, I needed to know how the world connected. What were the ideas that gave birth to the world? What is this thing called modernity? What is this thing called liberalism? Why does it think it is universal? How does that, how does that connect to who we are as human beings? Does evil exist in the world? Um, is there, you know, why do we belong to tribes? Um, what does it mean? What does race mean? Why does race matter? I had to find those answers in philosophy. And that's what I find myself just fascinated by endlessly reading. And the great thing about philosophy it will not give you the answers, but it will make you ask harder questions. Philosophy is a dialogue with itself. And that's what I enjoy about it. Mm, fantastic. We've got time for one more question, I think. Um, Ryan earlier asked, what do you think are the implications and economic development that recognizes the human need to belong? So what are the implications of, of developing with a human need to belong in a, an economic way? And how does this change our understanding of freedom? Well, that's, that's such a great question because it does go to a, what is an essential question that I ponder in the, in the book. And Peter and I have sort of exhausted that tonight as well. It's that idea of how easily we surrender our freedom for security. If you want to look at the answer to that question, go back to, to post-World War I Germany and the Weimar Republic, and how easily that was captured by a fringe right-wing movement um, that Adolf Hitler helmed. You know, when you feed on a sense of resentment, look what they have done to us. Look at how the Treaty of Versailles has punished us. We've lost our land. We're paying reparations. Um, look at these Jewish people who are exploiting us and running all the businesses. What's happening to us? Look at the monarchy who have led us into this catastrophic First World War. Um, look at these, these politicians who, are, who, who don't care for you. And basically, he was saying, drain the swamp, exactly what Donald Trump said. And, you know, he wrote in Mein Kampf um, that the German people would sooner the ideology without rival than the promise of liberal freedom. That is a devastating critique of the people, that they will surrender their freedom and allow atrocities to be committed. If you give them an ideology without rival, if you answer those questions for them. And for that period, of course, remember, you know, Hitler built the, right, the roads and the economy was strong and he was being fated by global leaders and they held the Olympics in 1936. Let's not forget that. Um, and, and he came to power at the ballot box. That impulse to, 
to trade our freedom for security, to look for the charismatic figure, to look at the person who will answer questions to the ideology without rival. We see that alive in our world today. And I dare say, without making the direct Hitler and Nazi comparison, but I dare say Xi Jinping plays that in China today. Look what we've done for you. We've lifted 700 million people out of poverty. We've returned China to the position of global power. I'm, I'm crack crushing down uh, on dissent. We're going to reunite Taiwan with the mainland. We won't be pushed around by the Westerners anymore. What do you need that Western freedom for? I'm answering all your questions. It is a very powerful impulse, and we very easily bend to that. And that's why we need the voices of dissent. We need the courageous people. And we need the thinkers and the writers and the people who are the artists who are going to, to speak back to that. Yeah. We've, um, that's a fantastic place to leave it. We do have a comment from Russell saying that um, politeness sometimes perpetuates the suffering of those of us who um, are, you know, have, have not yeah. got this. Politeness or silence or you know, all of the things that we allow um, that we allow sort of gross injustice to continue and perpetuate. Mm. I think it's a good point. And I think that um, this book is definitely, um, you know, a, a shout. It's not a, it's not a polite, um, it's not a polite, may I say this, it's a, it's, a, it's a shout which needs to be listened to. So thank you very much for bringing us this book. I think there's a lot of people with a lot of questions and a lot of comments. And I think that you would um, be, you know, it'd be great for you to go out and grab this book and, and continue that conversation in a philosophical way with the book itself. Thank you so much, Peter, for um, being such an amazing conversation person. This has been oh, a really great. Such, a, oh such a pleasure. What a great, I mean, Peter, what a master. It's so nice to be in your company, Peter. It's so, well, every conversation we have is memorable. Every time I bump into you or somewhere, it's always like, wow, Peter's here. I can have a real conversation. We've walked the same earth and uh, we've asked the same questions. It's just a real pleasure, mate. No, thank you very much, Stan. It's always been great to talk to you too. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for our um, guests tonight. Um, we will see you on the flip side. Thanks very much, Stan. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.